Good morning, campers, and welcome to Radio Camp Half Blood. I'm B, and I'm Zach. This week we read chapter sixteen of The Lightning Thief. We take a zebra to Vegas, or zebra if you're British, I guess. What happened in Vegas stays in Vegas. I think it's funny how the kind of like wordplay of the title is a little bit misleading. I guess, is how I would put it, because the way it's phrased, you would just assume that it's like, oh, we take a zebra to Vegas, like we ride a zebra to Vegas, but that is not the case. Majestically. Yeah. It's like racing stripes. It's exactly like racing stripes. The DVD that my dad had in his car for indeterminate <laughs> reasons. The one great thing about Rick Riordan is you can't take any of his chapter names too seriously, except... They do take a zebra to Vegas, but not the way you think it's going to be. Not in the way that you think. Haha, <laughs> very sneaky. Um, yeah, I, I think he intentionally kind of makes the syntax of the chapter titles like a little bit ambiguous. So you assume one thing, but it's actually another thing. My example would be like, Zach go gets a glass of orange juice. So what I do... Is you know obviously I would get it from the carton. No, I'm gonna actually plant a orange tree. I'm going to make orange juice by blowing up the tree and getting all that juice. That is pretty much like a Rick Riordan chapter title, or even just like the phrasing of it, where it's just like um, it's like the the thing that advocates Oxford commas or whatever. Where it's like I would like to thank my mom, the Dalai Lama, and it and George Bush, who is it? If you don't put like. A- comma there it's like one person i think the main thing though is like trying to get kids to read having those interesting chapter titles really does help i mean if i'm gonna look at goosebumps how every chapter ends on a cliffhanger the purpose for that is so the kid will read the next chapter here just imagine like a 12 year old 16 year old like reading the book and seeing we take a zebra to vegas it's like wait they go to vegas and they have a zebra i have to keep reading this same as with, like, the first chapter name is so ludicrous, you know, I accidentally vaporized my pre-algebra teacher. Now I have to know this. Why did he vaporize his pre-algebra teacher? Yeah, and it's not always specific enough that you know exactly what happens in the chapter, but it's intriguing enough and weird enough for you to go, wait a second, okay, what does he mean by this? So there is a zebra, this next chapter, and I was kind of right about the zoo thing a little bit, because I guess that's the only place you really find a zebra is a zoo unless you're like in really rich Africa. yeah or yeah i guess really rich and you own property where you keep a zebra i recently listened to a podcast where they talked about there was a guy in harlem who had a tiger you know what that kind of reminds me of one of my favorite movies of all time do you know what it is oh um i think secondhand lines yes yeah yeah there we go it's like one of my favorite movies of all time Yeah, I haven't seen that in a long time. I just watched it recently at a dentist office, and I forgot how good it was. It was just, like, on the TV? Yeah. How long were you waiting (laughs) that you watched the whole movie? It was near the end of it. Oh, okay, so you just saw the end. But I, like, went back and watched it again. It's such a good movie, but, yeah, it's kind of like, it's like the second-hand line Mm -hmm. approach of everything. Isn't, um, what's his name in that? The, uh, the kid from... Michael Caine! No, not him. (laughs) I mean, he is in that, but, like, the, isn't the kid played by, um... Haley Joel Osment? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Like, I was going to say the I, I See Dead People kid, but, you know, it's been a while since he was that kid. I know, he's, like, almost unrecognizable yeah. or now. Or Forrest Jr., I guess, in Forrest Gump. Was that his first acting <laughs> credit? It might be. I don't know, because him and um, Haley, not Haley Joel Osment, that's, 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 the... <laughs> that's a different one. <laughs> Jake Lloyd. Jake Lloyd. Wait, were they in a movie together? No. I mean, if you want a movie that was together with the quintessential two kids from the 90s. Oh, I see what you're the, saying. The Good Child. Oh, yeah. With, with him and Elijah uh, Wood. Elijah Wood and Macaulay, oh, Macaulay Culkin. Culkin. That's what it is. Yeah, you're right. I was going to say that Jonathan Taylor Thomas was like also like a the epitome of like a 90s kid. All of... Okay. Every famous kid from back then had like blonde hair parted in the middle. Like almost all of them. And my bowl cut. Like, that was the style. Everyone, blonde hair, parted in the middle. I don't know what it is. (laughs) It's like the Don Bluth hair of every, (laughs) like, male protagonist in any movie he's ever made. It's like, he knows how to draw two types of men. (laughs) 
a round one with a beard and a th- thin one with like the 90s hair. Those are the two. Are you talking about one and also that one round man is always voiced by Don DeLuise? Yes, the round man is often Don DeLuise. <laughs> Bonus points. It's almost as if he had a style and a person for every movie he made. Yeah. Speaking of that, I just rewatched The Brave Little Toaster, even though that's not a Don Bluth movie, I don't think. Yeah, isn't that um John Lasseter, I thought, right? Was isn't it? Isn't it like a spiritual so. predecessor to Toy Story, kind of? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. The Brave Little Toaster is very sad. You know, if you think about it, like, okay, B, I'm going to just describe the plot of one of the movies, like, very simplicity, and just tell me if this sounds like something a person on a drug would say. So, like, there's a toaster that talks with, like, his electric blanket and all his friends, so they hop on, like, a like a laundry hamper, and they use a fan to go up to Mars to rescue a baby. What? <laughs> I just described the plot for one of the movies. For a Brave Little Toaster? To space. Yeah, Brave Little Toaster goes oh, to right, Mars. Oh, right, the sequel. Yeah, I don't think I saw that one. Oh, I, I misremembered, by the way. It was uh, Joe Ranft, I was thinking of, who also worked on Toy Story. He was, like, a storyboard artist at Pixar. But he he worked on the Brave Little Toaster as well, so they're it, it's kind of similar. They're connected spiritually. So this chapter opens up with Percy Grover and Annabeth still a little irked by the whole water park yeah. fiasco. Because Ares is a and jerk have, who tricked them. Oh, he's a big jerk. What are you talking about? He's not a jerk. He's a big jerk. He's a mega jerk. Yeah, he's well. I mean, he does give them money though. Twenty dollars. That's true. In this economy. But I feel like if he was a real jerk, he would give no money. Oh, but he does give him double stuffed Oreos as well, so they don't technically starve to death. <laughs> yeah. So they meet up with Ares, and he's like, wow, you got my stuff. So like, they give him a shield, which turns into a bulletproof vest, because why not? Why not? And like, he tells him, Percy's like, I want you to tell me about my mom. And Ares is like, oh yeah, she's not dead. The end. Bye, losers. Yeah, it's like, they kind of already knew that. You didn't really help very much, but thanks. Yeah, and like he like drives off in the sunset, even though Percy has pissed him off. Yeah, he kind of, they were gonna kind of fight, but he's like, ah, oh, whatever, and he just leaves. Cause good old Ares gives Percy a backpack filled with twenty dollars, double stuffed Oreos, some new clothes, and some drachmas. Yeah, a little something to get them to their next location, which which is, is Vegas. California. Well, yeah, I mean like they're. Their intermediate location. Yes. And how he's done that is he's also provided them some wheels. The old American way of transportation, hitchhiking on the back of a semi-truck. Yeah. Or I guess more stowing away, I guess. It's not quite hitchhiking. Well, there aren't, there aren't like hobos. They ain't riding the rails to California. They're sort of riding the wh- r- riding the whales. They're riding whales. <laughs> <laughs> so long and thanks for all the good fish. It's like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh, yeah. Well, that those are dolphins, though. That's a little different. Well, no, there's also a space whale in, Gar- oh, in Guardians. In Guardians. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> That's not the same movie. <laughs> oh, we're getting these all confused now. I'm so sorry. Hitchhiker Guardians of the Galaxy. I would watch that movie. What are you talking about? It would be a weird movie. Yeah, a little bit. But, yeah, so they hop in the sub subway. Oh, my God. <laughs> they definitely don't hop in the subway. They hop into a truck. So they hop in the semi truck and they start. They hop in as it leaves, and they have two stops. They it's both to Vegas and to California. And this is where I like this because this book again, a lot of liberties. This is gonna sound really shocking, be to a kids book. Mm-hmm. Is the book slows down? Yeah, a little bit. You kind of uh, get the feel of the the environment with the truck, and you meet the animals that are inside of the truck, which Grover can talk to because he has magical animal powers i guess i don't know yes and while that's happening percy and annabeth start having a conversation because you know they have a time to let the scene breathe a little bit here which i like when books do that when it's not just constant action like we got in the truck and then we got to vegas there's like there's actually like time that passes yeah they don't jump cut they give yeah they give a little bit of atmospheric establish like a feel for what is happening which is nice and there's also a little bit more exposition about what happened regarding grover and um the girl whose name i always forget who died thalia yeah yeah oh, what, what happened there because they, they explain the whole story now yeah so basically grover was tasked with helping talia specifically but he ended up helping talia along with her friends i guess who are Luke and Annabeth. 
and that didn't work out so well because she died. So he he failed, even though that the other two were able to make it to the camp. Um, so he like holds that like in his heart as like his failure, and he feels, I guess, like guilt because of that. The way I look at it is kind of like Grover has survivor's guilt a little bit. Yeah. It's like, why couldn't they have taken me instead of them? So I guess I should describe what survivor's guilt is for people that don't know. So like when there's like a horrific tragedy or accident, which involves, you know, one person dying and the other person surviving, usually the survivor will feel guilty like they should have been the ones that died and the other person should have lived. Yeah. And that's kind of what he's going through, especially because he kind of failed at like this one task that he had. And Annabeth kind of tries to comfort him by saying like, oh, well, you like helped me come to Camp Half Blood, so it wasn't a total failure, but he still like feels guilt. Well, I mean, it's kind of like again, I like using this good old motto. It's like the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Which, if you think about it, one life or two, I would. Even though it's kind of like messed up to say, you know, lives shouldn't be put into a price, but you know, saving two lives compared to one, I would consider a much better thing than having two lives lost just for one person. Yeah, it's kind of like I guess if you weigh it that way, then. It, he technically succeeded, but he still, like, senses the... He focuses on the one aspect of his failure, which, I mean, isn't small, because someone died or became a tree. Well, yeah, I mean, it's also it's kind of like when you're up in the middle of the night and you, your brain's like, let's think about the most embarrassing moments of your life. Yeah. Oh, God, that's the worst, isn't it? When you're just like, oh, no, when I was in third grade and I was incredibly awkward that one time. Yeah, and then you can't sleep and you're just, like, you get like, your brain's just internally screaming. Yeah, it's terrible. But, I mean, I understand what... Grover is kind of going through here because, you know, his entire council even told him, like, you failed your mission, and his dream is to become a searcher. Even though he didn't fail his mission, he failed his mission. Like, you didn't do the right thing, even though, you know, you technically, in your heart of hearts, you did the right thing and brought these other two people in instead of Thalia, who decided to stay behind him because that is her character. of She sacked self-sacrifice as being the hero. It, it does explain a lot about side, sort of Grover's character and his his sense of, like anxiety around percy though he doesn't do the best job of it right like early in the book he doesn't really do the greatest job keeping tabs on percy so maybe he's not like the best satyr there is he might not be the best but he has the biggest heart yeah that's basically what percy says he's like oh well you're a very kind good person and you shouldn't feel terrible about this and then he kind of encourages him about finding pan because he's like oh one day you'll be the one who finds pan which which seems to bring him comfort while they're hanging out on the trailer of the truck, they start to notice that all the animals are super sad because this is like early 2000s, so animal cruelty. Yeah, it's like an abusive zoo. It's horrible. It's really sad. So the carnivores are only given vegetables and the vegetable... I, I want to call them omnomnomivores, <laughs> but that's the... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's me. You're thinking of me. Oh, the omnomnomivores? Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking of vegetarians. Uh, they give the vegeta- the veggie-eating animals meat yeah which is weird because it's not even like they're saving money they're just not paying attention to what they're feeding them which is strange i mean i would imagine some people that like just drive trucks don't really care it's like they didn't go to veterinarian school or like know anything i mean there are people that think their animals should be vegan which you know inadvertently kills their dogs or cats or whatever yeah especially cats which are like obligate carnivores or something but they they have to eat meat no matter what because they, they can't get their nutrients from plants. So if you think you want to put your animals on a trendy diet, just yeah, don't. Not the best. Even dogs, it's hard to have them have like a, a rounded diet if they're not eating meat. Unless you're like, they have like some weird food allergy and you're like really paying attention to it. But you know, it's, it's a really sad, horrific thing. And also while they're talking, Annabeth kind of gives more insight in her in her past again with her parents. And also that she actually made up with her dad about two years ago. Except, you know, when she's like, I'm going to give it one more try. And it was the same, like, people don't change. Yeah, it's really sad. Mentality. Um, yeah, she, like, talks about the kind of ring she carries with her and how it, like, belonged to her dad. And he's like, oh, come back. We'll, everything will be different. And it wasn't at all. And she was very, um, like, alienated by her stepmother. And, 
like was still being constantly pursued by monsters and putting her family in danger so she decided to come back to camp half blood which is sad that's what i like about annabeth though is you know she's still a very strong character you know she's very smart she's very witty but she's also i won't don't want to use the word broken but she feel like you actually get a sense of feeling for her because she's tried this several times and it hasn't worked it's not like her character is just like humph i don't like my parents because they think i'm like grody so i'm never gonna go home like she's yeah. tried several she, times she gave them a few uh chances which i mean it's weird because like percy kind of like encourages her to like not totally give up on the relationship which is like i think at a certain point it's fair for her to be like okay i'm, I'm gonna cut these people out of my life and not try to keep like being close to her dad which has time and again like hurt her so i, I don't think that that's like the best advice but you know i mean it also depends on like the situation i would imagine kind of like her dad is probably, I mean, he, he does feel remorse. Like, he's, like, asked, come back, I made a mistake, giving her something that, you know, really means a lot to him, which is his ring. I would imagine it's more of a stepmom, because this is, like, the Cinderella effect, and it's an evil stepmom, or, like, the overprotective mom. Yeah. That wants the best for their precious, like, Cinnabons. It's sad. It's a sad story. I mean, every way you think about it, it's a terrible situation, but that's kind of what makes Annabeth a great character is that, you know, she doesn't let this define her. She wants to be an architect. She wants to do all these all these wonderful things, except, you know, her past. She doesn't let her past dictate her future. Yeah. I think all of these characters are relatively optimistic considering the stuff that they've dealt with. Even Grover, despite, like, all the stuff he's been through, still wants to, like, help Percy and kind of... uh like redeem himself and Annabeth has been through a lot with her parents but I think they all have like this sense of of optimism regardless I mean it's kind of like everyone's broken in their own individual ways it kind of shows kind of like the happy part of being like alive and how like you know there's some parts where you suffer but you know there's some parts where you're truly happy and I think you know this shows the bright spot of it like have have you watched the first Guardians of the Galaxy I have not do you want me to spoil the first five minutes of the movie? Yeah, sure. I don't really care. <laughs> so the beginning of that movie uh, opens up with Peter Quill looking at his mom who's dying. because She has a brain tumor and like he's crying. He's sad and he gets abducted and it cuts to 30 years later. And he, the beginning of the movie is him dancing and having a good time listening to music. So it's like a weird juxtaposition where it's just like you can like, people will be like their most broken, but also time heals all wounds in a sense. Yeah. And also, obviously, they're trying to kind of like establish a... um like, rapport between the three characters and how they, like, bond over the fact that they've all been through a lot of stuff. So that's kind of, like, the foundation of their burgeoning friendships with each other. Uh, same as with, like, if you have characters that are all perfect, like, they don't have any problems, it doesn't make for a dynamic character. Same as with, like, having plans that go according to plan. I think when it comes to, like, a good heist movie, it's always, you know, they have their really good foolproof plan and then something goes wrong, completely wrong, and it's always their improvised plan that makes it is the one that works better than the original plan they thought of on I mean, the spot. I mean, that's also what makes Percy Jackson interesting is because they, like, start off in the beginning with kind of, like, this idea of how things are going to go, and, like, now they're in the back of a truck with a zebra that's being smuggled to uh, Las Vegas for some reason. I guess some sort of weird Las Vegas show, I imagine. Yeah, it's like hunka hunka burning love type of... I feel it's like an Elvis impersonator a, show. A zebra Elvis impersonator. I would love a zebra Elvis impersonator. I mean, it exists. There's every kind of uh, Elvis impersonator. There's like one um, like Spanish Elvis impersonator who calls himself Elvis. I prefer fat Elvis. I don't know about all that. What do you prefer? What, 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 what's your favorite Elvis? I like Jailhouse Rock Elvis. Jailhouse Rock? Well, for me, I'm more of a Johnny Cash person. Oh, I see. He kind of became more of Johnny Cash-esque. Um, have you ever seen that picture of Johnny Cash sitting in a bush eating strawberry shortcake? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, Johnny Cash had, like, that aesthetic, and, like, I think Elvis became so big he became a joke of, of himself. Yeah, I mean, he became, like, a parody, and people make fun of him a lot for, like, his weird health choices of, like, peanut butter and banana fried sandwiches. I like the Elvis sandwich, don't, don't knock it. It's pretty it. good. I, I'm not hating on it. It's delicious. Not the best for you. So, you know, they're driving down the road. They're getting a feeling like it sh they should have been home yesterday. And the good old semi-truck stops because they've reached Vegas. And, you know, Annabeth has the invisibility cap. And Grover and Percy have to, like, 
hide and be super sneaky. And they fail miserably almost because they open up the little place and they're going to take the zebra out and like it's going to go to a magician show where they're actually going to cut it in half, which it's like, yeah, magician show. Like literally cut it in half? I don't know. Like sell it to the exotic meat trade, (laughs) which is a thing. Which is a thing, yeah. Actually, in Vegas, I wouldn't doubt it because my sister lives near Vegas, near the Strip. So it's like there's weird, expensive places for everything. I feel like Vegas is an entire city of a liminal space. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, are we talking about Vegas uh, pre or post mob or during mob? No, basically. It's just like a weird place. Oh, it's pretty much like... So Vegas, because I I go there a lot, uh, pretty much... Uh, Vegas isn't it like a little city. It used to be more like in the early to mid 2000s. It was more like for kids mm-hmm. and families. And it kind of switched over to being more like this is like the Beverly Hills of the desert. Yeah, it's very strange. So you have like boutiques and everything is like super pricey. And if you've ever gone to Vegas, the middle of the night is the most interesting time to people watch because you just see a bunch of drunk you know, people just like stumbling around. Not so but so people wandering the streets. It's like wa- it's like watching an episode of like The Walking Dead. I feel there's just like something about Vegas where like people go there to like gamble and like the way that casinos are constructed, like there aren't any windows, so there's no sense of time. Well, no, so uh, so c- how casinos are like constructed, I can tell you this with certainty, is they're constructed in a way that they're supposed to feel vast, as well as there's no clocks yeah. in the walls, and there's the the windows are tinted so you don't know what time it is so you can feel like you're you like you've been there for years which is appropriate because soon we will see the casino that Percy and friends encounter yes so Annabeth actually like distracts the two guys as the zebra gets freed yeah animal liberation that's pretty great I love how Percy can talk to um the zebra because he has like this weird bond with horses because of the whole Poseidon thing so now we can confirm that Tina would want to be a daughter of Poseidon oh she definitely would yeah it would be like that that episode of of Bob's Burgers where she has like the um imaginary the horse? imaginary horse friend oh I love that episode what's his, the name of the horse again I don't remember. I don't remember. It's like hooves or something. It's something like that. Oh, that's going to bother me. (laughs) Hold on a sec. What's the name of the horse? (laughs) That's pretty Uh, good. uh, I used to be able to do the Tina, like, like, I literally was Tina Belcher growing up. Uh, uh, (laughs) um, What was I going to say? So, yeah, so all the animals are freed, and Grover tells me I have this special ability that will make sure that the animals will be safe and go back to the wild in the middle of Vegas, which... If you've ever been outside of Vegas, all those animals are dead. By the way, Jericho is the name of the horse. Jericho? Jericho. Jericho? Yeah. So, yeah, if you've ever been, like, near around Vegas, like, it's Vegas, and then it's just desert for a long time. Which is another horrifying, weird thing about it, right? Like, it feels so deeply post-apocalyptic that it's just this, like, like hedonistic city covered in neon where people go to, like, lose all their money and drink and, like, make mistakes, and then it's surrounded by desert. Uh, so I actually have a really funny Vegas story. Yeah. Uh, I used to play a lot of um, Fallout New Vegas, which is post-apocalyptic Vegas. And I got so good at, like, knowing all like, the casino names and stuff. I remember going to Vegas with some friends, and it was, like, sleepy tired because it was, like, four in the morning. And we get into a cab, and I told the guy, like, hey, can you take me to this casino? And it was a fictional casino in a fictional game. So it was, like, I was, like, naming oh off God. casinos. That's like, okay, oh, take funny. me this one. That one doesn't exist. Can you take me this one? Oh, this one also doesn't exist. I'm like, oh, wait. You're just thinking of the games. I don't quite understand what casino i should go to so it's like well, just take me to the mgm i don't know like vegas is like such a weird place because it's like the middle of the desert and also like to get to my house to vegas is about two hours just about and half that hour is just plain desert so if you're stuck you're stuck in the middle of the desert yeah there's i don't know i don't have really any desire to go to vegas really because it's kind of like such a strange artificial thing where it's like i'm gonna make this tourist destination in the middle of the desert it's like against the will of nature (laughs) it's like the hubris of man isn't that just california for you because it's we're just simulated we're pretty much like a simulated oasis because we're technically a desert state yeah that's true too Obviously, the people that were driving the truck aren't quite happy that all the animals are free, and they start to chase the gang, and they end up going into a casino, which luckily is kid-family friendly, because that's really rare in Vegas now. Yeah, that's pretty rare. I mean, I guess there's Circus Circus, but that's about it now. 
Uh, so they hop into this casino, and it is like the greatest child fun fair in existence. It's got video games. It's got bungee jumping, rock climbing, zip lining, uh, laser tag, mech fighting, VR experiences. And this is 2005. Yeah, it's just a really awesome kind of alluring place. This reminded me a lot of um, when I was a kid, uh, my dad got this like trip for the whole family to go on a cruise to nowhere, basically. So you don't actually get off the cruise ship, but you do all like the fun activities. Oh, was this the on RMS the Titanic? And <laughs> <laughs> I guess it was kind of like that a little bit. So it was just like this enormous ship that you would oftentimes forget you were on the water because it was like a giant mall and a theater and like karaoke and like dozens of restaurants. It was insane. It was the weirdest experience. See, isn't that like a weird thing about ships though? It's like you can have stuff like that and you're pretty much like the, the concept of like a cruise has always been alien to me because they seem so boring. It was pretty fun for a kid, especially because there was an arcade in like the basement of the ship, I guess. Oh, so it was in the boiler um, room? Where, <laughs> not quite, but yeah, it was like in a, in a, like a lower deck where, um, so uh, there was a game room and you didn't have to put quarters into any of the machines. You just like, they put these special yeah, devices on the machines that yeah. you just had to press a button. Yeah. And it was very exciting f- for my childhood self who was obsessed with those games and my parents hated me giving hated hated my parents hated me my parents hated giving me quarters all the time so i just was like down there all the time like playing skee ball and like little racing games and i feel like that's kind of the vibe here where it's like you can do anything and everything's free and you have magical money that never runs out i mean i've gone to arcades like that there's actually this wonderful one in pasadena near where i live that's pretty much like that where you just spend twenty dollars and you get Mm -hmm. unlimited play for the night i don't know there's something like really fun about arcades but here it's like uh, the lotus hotel that's what this place is called and this is literally like stranger danger don't go in this place the casino yeah it's very it's kidnapsville um, suspicious yeah it's like Child Snatcher from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Um, hello, children. Uh, so they go up to like to the person that like runs the front desk. Like, oh, we've been expecting you this entire time. Almost like they're shining. Like, well, yeah, you've always been here. Kind of like the, he gives them like a room key. Like you automatically get free rooms here. It's like something that would never happen in Vegas. You get unlimited money, and you go up to the four thousandth floor. Also, your free bag of candy. And a puppy. Yeah, here's your stranger candy made especially it's by strangers. It's just like, if, how would you react to the situation be? Because I would just be like, this is kind of weird, but okay. See, I, I'm of two minds about this. Because on the one hand, I'd be like, I'm very skeptical of strangers in general and people trying to be nice. I'm like, all right, what's what's your catch? What's the deal here? But also, I would be really hyped about the situation and I might convince myself that it's not a big deal and that I'm just lucky and that it's like, oh, I get a bunch of free food and I get to play these games all the time. So if it, if it's that case, then I don't know. If you look at Gullible in the dictionary, there's just a picture of me in it. <laughs> so you'd be like, oh, wow, these people are really yeah. nice. And it's like, uh, you know, I know the word gullible. Let me check your dictionary. Like they actually pulled a dictionary from behind the counter and gives it to me. And there's just a picture of me. Oh, wow. Yeah. Hey, did you know that Gullible's written on the ceiling? Ah, oh, Chucks. Ah, oh, man. No, I didn't look up. Did you look up? If I said yes, would you think highly of me? <laughs> I've never even been in the same physical space as you. How would that have happened? <laughs> I flew all the way to California. I snuck into your home. I rode on the ceiling, and then I silently flew back. For comedic effect, yes, I looked up. In reality, no, I did not. But... I mean, like, as a person now that just loves true crime, I'd be like, no, get me out of this place as quickly as possible. Yeah, it's a, it seems murdery or, like, child trafficking. There's a lot of stuff. So my first thought about this place would be like, hey, does H.H. H. Holmes live here? Is this his murder hotel? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. What, what's that um hotel called where everyone dies? Are you talking about the Cecil Hotel? Yes, yeah, the Cecil Hotel. I've actually been to the roof of that one. Isn't that where they found the dead girl in the water tank? Yes, that's why I was up there. Uh, 
Aren't you not allowed on the roof? Um, I got a special tour. AKA you snuck onto the fire station. No, no, uh, I just asked an employee (laughs) and they said, yeah, sure. Wow. Really? I'm kind of surprised. That, well, didn't they rename it, too, because of bad publicity? Yes, because it was also featured in American Horror Story. But this was, like, before that. So it was kind of like you had to know this about the Cecil Hotel a little bit. So uh, a lot of serial killers stayed there. I think Richard Ramirez actually stayed there, too. And it's also right next to the last bookstore. Two serial killers, one suicide. Possible suicide. We don't really but, know. But, yeah, no, Probably. it's like right next to the last bookstore, which is the greatest bookstore in human history. Oh yeah, I've heard a lot about that. I feel like I'll definitely go there if I if I go to California. But yeah, no, I've I've been up to the the to the roof to the water tank, and it's like oh, if we're gonna get more into true crime, it's like it's almost impossible for her to have fallen in without someone pushing her in. Dun dun dun. You know, a kids podcast. Yeah, for children, young people. But yeah, no, it's it's too good to be true, and they play such games as I love. Grover plays the reverse hunter simulator where he plays as a deer mowing down people. It's like the perfect game for him. I did used to play that deer hunter game when I was a kid. I don't know why. I never was like intrigued by actual hunting and would never want to shoot an actual deer. But I liked those games. They I mean, it's kind of like me going fishing. It's almost like what Ron Swanson says. It's like meditation, but I get to kill something. Uh, so yeah, so it's way too good to be true. They go up to the 4,000th floor, wherever they go, and they're just having the best time because I love the one part that like, there's actually like, uh, you can actually fire live guns on the roof, which doesn't seem terrible whatsoever. Yeah, that doesn't seem like a bad idea at all. So Percy and all the gang are just super happy. They're just spending like hours in this place and they're totally forgetting their mission almost. Because it's too good to be true. Reminds me of, um, like, in The Wizard of Oz with, like, the poppies will put you to sleep sort of thing where it's like they get distracted by their... Uh, they d- get distracted from their goal because they get, like, too sleepy. But thankfully, Percy is so dumb he asked the stupidest question about... Because he was, like, <laughs> hanging out with this kid who's so groovy and, like, he's wearing, like, bell-bottom jeans. I just kept thinking of, like, Fez from... That 70s show? I guess, yeah. Just a really 70s looking dude is how he describes it. Some Elvis impersonator son. I don't know, like for me it's a problem because I use a bunch of different like generational lingo. It's like I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. I love that they described his hair as um, permed and gelled like a New Jersey girl on homecoming night. (laughs) I can't even imagine what that looks like. I can. Is it? I've seen it. Is it like an actual like joke that's actually really funny? Well, yeah, it's like j- just like really curly and crunchy and held up in like a giant sort of Is it like, updo like thing. a schnooky so, type of hairdo. Yeah, the well, yeah, exactly. I think more now that the perm isn't as like curly hair isn't more as much of a thing. Nope, it's now the um, man bun still, unfortunately. Yeah, well, like I mean, for like like women's fashion, it's more like the bump it or something like that. Which I even that is like ten years old by now. It's probably another weird style. I think now it's just like really bad highlights and like beachy waves that are clearly not natural. <laughs> just having like extremely dyed hair. Yeah, in general, just really badly incorporated dyed hair with like roots showing. I mean, that's kind of the, that's an aesthetic. Percy starts asking him, oh, what year is it? And he's like, oh, it's 1977. You know what my brain said? Yeah, what? Oh, that's the year Star Wars. <laughs> oh, let's go see Star Wars. I was like, oh, man, I should go see Star Wars. And then he asks another kid, like, hey, it's 1985. My brain, hey, that's when Back to the Future was, like, the year of 85. Another, yeah, it was like another guy told me it was 1993. I was like, oh, that was the year I was born. <laughs> but then Percy's like, oh, no, we got to get out of here. I keep forgetting my mission. Like, what if we're stuck here forever? Yeah, I feel like this is, like, a super common, like, theme in a lot of, like, um, like cross-country road trip, like, traveling kind of movies where there's always, like, a moment that's, like, distracting. And it's not necessarily, like, a bad thing because, like, you know, um, there's, there's always, like, these obstacles that get in the way that are, like, violent or people trying to block your path. But then it's, like, the more insidious thing that blocks your path is actually something that is alluring and like interesting or relaxing to you that like gives you a break from like the 
like endless onslaught of monsters that the protagonists are fighting and that's what distracts them from their goal i i think a perfect example of that is like in dumb and dumber when they actually accidentally open up the case and they find there's all that money so they start like instead of doing their mission of bringing back the suitcase filled with money they start spending it yeah i mean (laughs) dumb and dumber is an interesting example to pull but yeah like it's It's common for any kind of movie that involves like a quest of like, oh, we have to get from point A to point B and we have to do a task. Um, There's usually like, um, actually, the best example I could think of is if you've seen Labyrinth, there's a lot of moments where she like deals with like puzzles and like, um, you know, actually people trying to block her way and the Goblin King and all that stuff. But the most insidious thing that stops her from trying to move forward is when she feels like she's in her back in her bedroom like safe with all of her like possessions and she doesn't have to go anywhere to save her brother and it's kind of like that's the most insidious and like tricky thing that blocks you from your goal is this supposedly really nice thing that is what you wanted all along but it's actually all just an illusion i mean okay so the the thing with labyrinth though is it's also kind of like uh sarah the main character of that Mm -hmm. is a terrible person so it's kind of oh yeah she's a jerk she like (laughs) wishes her brother gets kidnapped by goblins like that's not a cool person i wish the goblins would take him away what jennifer connelly what did your baby yeah pretty bratty of her to do i mean the entire movie is her becoming a much better less terrible person i mean the beginning of the movie she starts she's larping the journey she is LARPing, that's true. <laughs> you don't realize but how by much... by herself, <laughs> just kind of lonely the only, LARPing. Like, the things I think about that movie, unfortunately, with Labyrinth, because it's one of my favorite movies, is, like, all the crazy special effects, and then just David Bowie as himself. So Percy tries to convince the gang that this is all an illusion, and, you know, reality is a myth. And that's kind of hard to do. They're so distracted, because it's the them, them video games, you know, them addictive video games. Yeah, it's like Roll Doll with TV. <laughs> Because Annabeth is playing, like, this super elaborate, like, hologram building game. Yeah, well, basically, like, the way that the games are constructed is you could, like, live out whatever kind of, like, fantasy life you want to be leading. Um, That's why they're so distracting to them, because they're perfectly designed. It's kind of like in Pinocchio with Pleasure Island, where all the kids do turn into donkeys. Yeah, that's a good example, too. Yeah, there's a lot of examples in, in fiction, um of like sort of insidiously nice places that seem nice but are actually oh you just mean like, like hansel and gretel and the diabetic nightmare that is the candy house see the thing is i would never want to eat a candy house <laughs> because if you have ever made a gingerbread house and you've left that gingerbread house for more than a day sitting on your kitchen table it's not an edible food anymore. It's just, like, cement made out of sugar. It's disgusting. The gumdrops get all hard and weird. Like, it's not an appealing you telling me you treat. Will, you know what would be really funny if someone made, like, a Cribs version of the gingerbread house? <laughs> yeah, this is the oven where I cook my children. And this is where the magic happens. <laughs> and it's just, like, a giant cauldron. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would love that. But yeah, no, so somehow <clears throat> Percy convinces both of them because of Disco Darren and I guess every other... Disco Darren. <laughs> That's what isn't like, isn't it? Like Disco Darren? <laughs> you know, they also probably yeah, like run into like bottoms. Paul Blart Mall Cop while they're there. Wait, how so? Because there's the one, the sequel is in Vegas. Oh, I had no idea. I've never seen I, either I, of them. Thanks to Death to Us Blart, I know. I know. Oh, right. <laughs> right. Death to Us Blart. I forgot about that podcast. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. So, they can, he convinces, you know, Grover that this is all a mess because of, um, you know, he needs to think of the trees. And for Annabeth, he tells her, because she actually, they kind of explained early on in the book about the myth about spiders and how the original, like, pretty woman that was named Arachna was cursed by Athena to become a, the first spider. So all spiders now threaten uh, Athena's children. Yeah, they, which... they hold a blood oath against her offspring, I guess. So the moral of the story is don't let Annabeth near Hogwarts or the Forbidden Forest. Oh, yeah. With oh, Aragog. Or, or, or near uh, 
the other giant spider from Schneb. Lord of the Rings. Yeah. I think that's... I never know how to say her name. I, I It's Schneb, but like in the new Lord of the Rings game, this is kind of pissed me off. She's a sexy lady. Oh my God, what? Yeah, and the new one, they, she's in the game, but like she takes on the form of a sexy lady. That's so dumb. It, yeah, the I know. The whole point is the spider is so So you scary. know what that also means, B? Just randomly while what? they're doing it, like she starts hanging out with Scarlett Johansson. Oh God. The ultimate... Sp- like, get away from me. <laughs> Spider Man's there. They're like, uh. all this, all the spider based, of uh, the spider fams there. Oh my god, that that seems yeah. like a video that just needs to happen. What you mean, Annabeth meeting Spider Man? <laughs> yeah, Annabeth meeting Spider Man and all the spider family because they're all attracted <laughs> to her. That's horrifying. But yeah, so she uh, kind of like snapped. I, I want to stop talking about spiders. <laughs> I love spiders. <laughs> I think we've talked about this. I'm not a fan. I'm the Ron Weasley of my friend group. I love I cute, cuddly spiders. I'm perpetually freaked out by spiders. It's too many eyes. It's too many. So they actually end up trying... So almost like Lord of the Rings, they're about to leave when the front gate guy is like, don't you want to become platinum members? And they're almost tempted by greed again. And it's like they have the moment where like Percy trying to stick out his hand but like pulls it back. Like, no, we can't. We have a quest. And they run outside and it is now... Com- the weather's completely changed. It's stormy and dark and gloomy. And guess what? They look at the date and they are only have one day for the quest before yeah, it's over. Yeah, they've been there for like five days thinking that it was a very short period of time. Because I guess there's some sort of weird space time continuum thing going on where it feels um, much faster. It's like Narnia. Yes, except this time there actually it's is repercussions. Narnia. Which, you know... This is also like a George Lucas device now, where he said that, you know, the second you put a literal time clock in your movie, or I guess in this example, they only have a day, the drama has now increased, because now you're working against time, there's now a physical clock working against their... Yeah, well, it would be kind of, like, less dramatic tension if they had, like, five days to get from Las Vegas to Los Angeles. Like Which that's... doesn't take that long, it takes about four or five hours. Yeah, it's hours. not that far away. So it would just sort of be them like, all right, we're here when we're four days early. Like, it would just be a weird thing. I mean, what could have happened is, you know, they get to Los Angeles and then they get distracted. They go to all the places and they don't know where to find Hades for those days. And they're like, they're like dwindling their days down, desperately trying to find where they need to go. I don't think that that's as compelling, I guess. It would not work. And I like this more because it's like now there's a literal time clock. And as the reader, as a kid, you now want to know they only have a day. So they're against the clock. They're against everything. Yeah, it's like Jack Bauer. <laughs> dude, dude, dude. Do you ever watch that show? I love I, it never 24. appealed to me. <laughs> like, you don't realize, B, I love trash TV. <laughs> oh, I'm. you're talking to someone who watches Revenge. So I understand <laughs> the appeal of watching trash like, TV. For me, my idea of a spa day is like putting on like... Like either Pawn Stars or hunt Hardcore Pawn, and like watching people oh, complain God. about prices is like the greatest trash TV. I hate those people. They're all terrible. <laughs> like there's like watching Hardcore Pawn is so much fun because people are like oh, here's my gold coin, I want fifty thousand dollars for it, and it's like I can give you about fifty <laughs> bucks for it because that's how much the price of gold is, and they don't understand like prices. It's horrible. I hate those shows. Oh, I love them. They're like my favorite shows to watch. Including the like, people who run those pawn shops are clearly terrible. Don't they take place in Las Vegas? Uh, pawn Stars does. Uh, yeah. Hardcore Pawn doesn't. I think it's Detroit. I can't remember. And also, what's his name? Like, what is it? Rick's Restoration is also there. Yeah, I, mean, I like that show better. They're in the business of making money. So that's kind of what. Yeah, I know that it's it. Yeah, it's like Pickers or whatever too, which I, I think is a little bit of a better show. Oh, American Picker. No, my favorite out of all of them is Oddities. Oh my god, Oddities is the best show. Have you actually been to Obscura? 
I haven't been to it actually because I feel like it would just be such a tourist trap. But I don't think um, now because no, no one really. It's no that's true. No like one really th- thinks about it anymore. But I love the weird guy Edgar who just shows up every once in a while <laughs> and he's like, "Hello, I'm Edgar," and it's like, "Who talks like that? You sound like a Bella Lugosi character. No one sounds like that in real life." I just would love to just go there and not like just browse around and buy like a container of tea <laughs> I, or something weird. Did I tell you about the time that um they're gonna release an episode about this book that was supposedly bound in human skin so um they kept advertising it on like what is it the science channel whatever channel that show is on it was on the travel and my channel, sister was really hype about it so she kept googling human skin book oddities human skin book book human skin like over <laughs> and over again they were just taking like a mid-season break or something so like she just ha- gets put on a list somewhere probably from googling <laughs> human skin every well, actually, day i know that episode then, it wasn't actually human skin it, it wasn't was pig. human skin it was just pig yeah anyway spoiler alert for an episode of oddities from four years ago but no, it had been more it would have been like 2000 <laughs> like uh, okay. no i think we were i was in college though so i think it was like four ish years ago but yeah that was a great I show i would love to like i miss that show See, I'd love and every to... once in a while it was like a weird person who came in who's like i make art from toenails can you sell this and they're like i don't know about that no i remember <laughs> That's I think the crazy one of my favorite thing episodes is every time is the one... a weird person came in they were always like kind of cringing like eh, hey th- you're strange and it's like you run a weird place that sells like Boshane skulls and like pigs fetuses in a jar and you're weirded out by this person who makes toenail art like that reminds me of y'all the are one, all weird was it my favorite episodes the one where like their their, their young assistant guy it goes on a date with that girl and it's like, like trying not he's to great. be awkward but she's being awkward as well and it's like they end up falling in love with each other because of... they're both awkward together and i just remember because their, their anniversary gift was like <laughs> you got me flesh eating kissing cockroaches oh right, i remember that <laughs> he looks like a tim burton character came to life <laughs> it's like i'm a real boy now it's like a stop motion figurine from one of his movies just like was imbued with humanity and walked away and started making exploded skulls for a living i would love to get an exploded skull that is my dream <clears throat> that's not my dream that is my that is like my prized dream if i could own one object it would be an exploded skull one not a object bicycle, of course so- <laughs> yeah it's a weird, weird show. I miss it though. It's it's very bizarre. My boss was on it, like once. What? Yeah, Lloyd was on it. That's really funny. He's also Maybe in he one like, of them. Uh, pull the, the connections, like have you like have a tour of the place or something? I could. You know what? I probably could get a tour of the place if I just asked really nicely. Hey, try to loop me in on that if you ever end up going. If, I'll take you if we go. We'll do an episode about it. It won't be related at all. It'll just be this weird, like, spin off of oddities. We'll just be us. Awesome. I took when Tyler came for the first time. I took him to Ridley's Believe It or Not, and he was like kind of like weirded out, like just rushing through. And like, oh man, this is awesome. Like, you probably would have been a much cooler person to take. Oh yeah, I mean, I've been to the Ripley's Believe It or Not in New York, so it's I'm, I imagine it's similar to that. Which one's the original one? Uh, I don't know, actually. Well, let's see. Ripley was from San Francisco, because he... he, Oh, so it's probably the West Coast one. Yeah. (coughs) Because he was a... I read a book all about him. He's like an interesting fellow. Like, one of his earliest memories, he remembered the San Francisco earthquake. And that kind of was what, like, made him who he was. That, that's what messed him up. Well, it's like how Maurice Sendak remembers the Lindbergh baby kidnapping, and that messed him up forever, and that's why he wrote Where the Wild Things Are. <laughs> Actually, more more specifically, that's why he wrote um, uh, In the Night Kitchen, I think. Baby Boy. Was the one about the Lindbergh baby. Well, not quite, but kind of inspired by it. I was going to say. But yeah, the the chapter kind of ends with, you know, they they have a physical clock now and they have to drive about 4 or 5 hours to get to good old Los Angeles. So B, what do you think Los is going to happen in the next chapter? Um, should I read the chapter title? Yes, yes, please. Yes, all right. <clears throat> we shop for waterbeds. Okay. Um So what do you think is going to happen? 
I have no idea. They end up in a mattress store? A furniture store? Um, I don't know why waterbeds would be involved. Does he, like, use the water in the waterbed with his magical waterbending powers? I'm um, not gonna tell you a single I'm, thing. It's, I, it's, it's an apostrophe, Zach. I'm not speaking to anyone specifically. <laughs> I almost just called you Tyler. Um, <laughs> Legas, Meg. I didn't, though. I didn't. Legas, Meg. So yeah, I mean, I don't have much guesses other than that. They're they're they only have one day to get to Hades. Yeah. So I guess they have to take the highway to hell. Yeah, basically. Do do do. Um, do 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 do. That's all I can do before we get like copyrighted. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, it's fair use. It's, but what did yeah, you think of your the chapter? I like this chapter. It was fun. I felt like there was a lot of stuff going on. Like, I think you even made this comment um, before we recorded um, that there's sort of like discrete sections where it's like they they go back to confront Ares, which I feel like could have easily been in the last chapter. And then them leaving for Vegas could have just been this whole chapter. Um, And then there's like the whole section with them in the back of the truck which was kind of like a whole other setting and then the weird thing that happens with um with the hotel so there's like a lot going on um but i like it i feel like the plot is moving forward and we're learning things about grover and about annabeth um and about percy's mom a lot of stuff was revealed yeah i mean that's Uh, kind of like the great thing about this chapter though is you get all your characters what well the one thing that i love about this chapter is that all the characters become more well-rounded and they're not, they're less two dimensional. They become more human. I think that's the way I'm trying to be using here more often. Is you know, they actually seem like even though they're demigods, even though they're demigods. I mean, they they walk a fine line between having powers and just being vulnerable people. Yeah, well, because they they discuss like the sort of emotional vulnerability of the things that they've had to deal with. Um, and I like that aspect of the book. I mean, they could it, like, easily have it them. like Yippie Kaye, where everyone, every great venture they have, like there's not a price to pay. But here, you know, they have. Yeah. This, this chapter was also more like cerebral, I think, because there wasn't like a whole like, you know, slapdash, like sword fight or some sort of like action scene. And it was way more about like character development, talking about like the different things Grover's been through, the different things Annabeth has been through. Like Percy learns the thing about his mom. Um, they have like the whole conversation with the animals in the back of the truck. That's like very sad and complicated and like Grover is sad about it because he can talk to the animals. Um, and then like the, the distracting thing of the, the Lotus hotel. Um, it's like way more about kind of their own internal demons, I guess, and their own flaws than like anything external, I guess. I mean, that's kind of the great thing about it though, is with Rick Ryden. The interesting thing about it is, is that look, this is all like a first person slash third person perspective, but we still get, we understand the thoughts and feelings of every character in it. That isn't just Percy. Like you get more into everyone else's headspace instead of like Percy's like, well, I felt this way. And like, he actually can see the reactions of both Annabeth and Grover, including the animals. And then let's like, he also, this chapter also does a lot with like giving into temptation, such as, you know, what is a better place to have temptation than Vegas? Yeah, that that's a good point. It's like a good like representation of like everyone's fatal flaw, like the thing that they most are distracted by. Which um, is if you look at it, Percy's okay. fatal flaw is obviously his mom. Which everyone yeah. keeps even Aries is like, you should like not eighty six your mom, but you should like just pretend she's dead because it's gonna make things a lot easier because he even says Oh, we totally forgot about the one most important thing about this chapter. Oh, my God. Wait, what? The dream that he had. Percy has a dream. Oh, God, I forgot about the dream. (laughs) He has another dream with a weird voice. Yeah, what what do you think that dream is? Um, Because it's kind of like it happens so fast in this chapter that I totally forgot about it. Yeah, um, he jumps into the weird hole where the voice is coming from. And then he wakes up. No, because remember, he wakes up in a classroom, and there's a girl <laughs> sitting there. Oh, right, yes. And he's um he's in the straitjacket, and he can't pick up his pencil. And he just... And it's t- 
Natalia, right? Yeah. The girl. Which reminds me of like the lead singer of the Ting Tings. I'm not sure why. Just the way they describe her. Okay, I guess. I was going to say, is that her name? Because I don't... <laughs> Didn't she have a whole song about her name? Uh, yes, but my favorite song... They call me Talia. I mean, That's one of my, my favorite name. songs for them is just Shut Up and Let Me Go. Because it's such a funny song. That The funny thing about that video is if you watch it, um, it's like so very clearly like just the exact same as the video for Seven Nation Army <laughs> by the White Stripes. And they even were on like VH1, like, what videos inspire you the most? Like, make a playlist. And one was the video for seven nation army and it was like the guy from the tank was like yeah i really like that song and the video is great it really inspired us it was like yeah clearly it's the same it's the same video though my favorite video is probably love me dead by ludo <laughs> very low. i feel like i know that one but i but yeah, yeah no it's like it's um, just this like weird dream that percy has where he meets thalia and then it's like again, it's like bringing back. It's like the weird surrealism. Even the weird voice talks about how like the hero <laughs> sees his. Like it's kind of like, I don't know if it's like a like it kind of cheats the audience a little bit. It's like you kind of know what like this person's plan is because it's equivalent of like Harry Potter like seeing the visions of Voldemort in the fourth book. Like we're per- or- yeah, it's it's a little bit like that. I would I would compare it to that too. Like ding, everybody mark off your Harry Potter reference bingo. <laughs> But yeah, no, it's like that where it's like he gets visions from the villain's perspective and it's kind of like the main character gets an insight again. it's I don't know if it's... I For me, if I always found it to be like weird like Rick Riordan kind of cheating in the narrative because, you know, the main characters don't understand or they understand the villain's plan much better now. Yeah, it gives him like a little foreshadowing snapshot of what's going on. I'm still super confused about what's going on because he says it's a familiar voice. They don't really say who... Hmm. It's Padfoot. If it's a familiar voice, is it like someone that we would know? Yes. I, you want me to spoil it for you, B? It's Peter Pettigrew. <laughs> Basically. Um, I'm trying to think who it would be. It can't be a mortal. I'm not saying anything. I feel like it's somebody we've already met. Like a camper or a counselor or something. That's going to be a big betrayal. Do you remember the prophecy, B? You want me to tell it to you? Yes, I do. You shall go west and face the god who has turned. You shall find what was stolen and see it safely returned. You shall be betrayed by one you call a friend. And you shall fail to save what matters most in the end. Hmm. Someone you call a friend. So, I feel like it has to be a camper. Because I don't know if he would describe, like, Mr. D or... Chiron as his friend, really. But there's also a god that has turned. Remember, there also is the little feud between Poseidon and Zeus. There's also That's the true. civil war that's brewing. There's so many different factors here. I feel like it has to be someone that we know, but I... I is it Luke? Like, it's somebody like that. I feel like it's either going to be Luke or Annabeth who betrays him in some way. But I feel like Luke isn't even really his friend. Like, they only hung out for a very short time. I'm not going to tell you anything what's going to go on. I'm not going to say... Okay, I'm not, I know. I'm just, you know, spitballing here. What I can say, B, is that the person is going to be either the most obvious or stupid person you're going to think of, and it's going to work. And it's a good thing right. you don't look at spoilers. I mean, there aren't that many characters, so I feel like there's only a few that it could be who betrays him. But we're going to find out see. very soon, hopefully. Or On ma- the next episode of No, Radio it's not going to be the next episode. I can tell you that with a certainty without spoiling anything. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm joking. <laughs> that would be funny. They told me you <laughs> killed him. No, Percy. I am your and stepfather. Your <laughs> no, it's not true. It's impossible. Search your feelings, Percy. You know it to be true. That is make my Star Wars reference for this week. Yep. I think uh, everyone has full Radio Camp Half-Blood bingo boards at this point. <laughs> I'd l- okay, if any one of our listeners wants to like totally make bingo boards right now, I'd love it. Yeah, that would be really great, actually. I know that one would be like Harry Potter reference, one would be Star Wars reference. One is Goosebumps reference. <laughs> one of them is Zach um, Makes an Obscure Movie reference. Uh, yours is like uh, referencing Roald Dahl or Maurice Sendak. Yeah, Roald Dahl or Maurice Sendak. Lemony Snicket. Well, that's like the middle of the board, because that's like... Yeah, let me think it's just the center of the board. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you get any messages this week? All right, so I got I got a message on Tumblr from 
Slipnir, son of the god of chaos. Apologies if I butchered that. Um, just says, I love your Percy Jackson podcast. It's a pleasure to listen to and so off topic that it speaks to me on a spiritual level. I kind of appreciate what you're saying there. Um, I know that we try to focus as much as possible on the general theme of children's literature, but we do often. <laughs> I think that's perfectly fine because who would want to hear a podcast that could be for if we talk just about the content, it's almost like what's the point of reading the books? Yeah, it would just be an audiobook, yeah, basically. Be, a poorly summarized audiobook with the two of us talking over each other. And it's like, more, it wouldn't... more of it, like, I've always found the interesting thing about the podcast is that it's more of us just having a conversation and we just use the books as a nice little, like, anchor. Yeah, I would agree. That's kind of the, the because, vibe. Because normally this is how we talk. Like, we'll randomly have weird tangents. That's true. So <laughs> We will talk like, we'll... We'll stop recording and we'll continue to talk the same way about all sorts of weird things. <laughs> but we got a lot of emails this week, so thanks everyone for sending so many wonderful emails. How we many emails did we get this week? Uh, we got a few. We got like six or seven, which is wow. really good. We've that actually is really the good. greatest thing is we reached our first milestone, and I cannot believe it. We've gotten to our first ten thousand downloads, which is That's insane. so crazy. To me. I'm like, I'm so blown away by that. Like we've been doing this podcast for but almost, like less than six months. And already we've we've seen a lot of support from people. Um, I mean, I wasn't even a, a member of, like, the Percy Jackson fandom at all. So it's really cool to, like, see how welcoming, welcoming and kind everyone has been. If I could, like, high-five every single one of you, it would probably take a couple days to, like, high-five 10,000 people. Yeah, that's crazy. It's really cool. So our first email is from Lycalis, L-I-A-K-A-L. L L I S. Sorry if we can't. Pr if I cannot pronounce your name, I'll just say it out loud, just to be nice. Hi, I love your podcast, and it made me ask myself questions about Percy Jackson I would never have thought of. Are you planning on talking about Heroes of Olympus? We've we've talked about this before. We're gonna keep doing this show until as long as we can. <laughs> until the end of time, for it is our lot in life. <laughs> till the end of time. Hey. <laughs> So we actually got this really heartwarming message. It's not really a question, but I think, uh, in my opinion, this is the reason why I podcast is for these emails I'm about to talk about. And it's so heartwarming that, you know, it's just, thank you. I, From the bottom of my heart, I'm going to be probably the same from B's heart. Thank you. Also the B heart, yes. <laughs> from both our hearts. They have a busy B heart. It, yes, it, it is a buzz with so much gratitude. Uh, so from... Riley, this series has helped me through my life. I made my friends. I got a boyfriend from this. Strangely, it was the movie that got me interested in the books. I have ADHD and I was tested when I was little. I've always thought I was different and a freak. Reading this book for the first time made me feel like I was special. I started the series when I was 12 and now I'm 16. Still haven't finished all of his works, but I'm still looking back on the book series that told me being different wasn't a bad thing. I've been wanting to meet Rick for a long time just to tell him thank you for making me feel special. That's really cool. I love that. I mean, that I, we really talked about this when we interviewed the um, the counselors from the actual Camp Half Blood in Brooklyn, and it's it's really nice that like the the story of Percy Jackson has sort of like empowered people with um, different like learning disabilities to feel like it's not necessarily always a negative thing to have those no, disabilities. I think, I think that's a really important thing to have as well as it's like making, having like a platform like our podcast, like, you know, that's one thing I love that. And if anyone even wants to say stuff like this, we're going to talk about it. We're going to read it on the air because Radio Camp Pathlet is not just a podcast for us, even though, you know, for us, we have so much fun doing it, but it's, we also want to make it as community driven as possible. So getting emails like this truly make it special. We'd like to, you know, put these up on our platform and talk about them. And I find the one interesting thing that has always drawn me to Rick Riordan has been, you know, he writes like everything, almost like the Gene Rottenberry approach of where everything is normal and no one is, they, they don't have like weird understandings or it's like weird coded messages about it. It's just like, Hey, this is it. And this is normal. Uh, such as dealing with, you know, mythology, dealing with racism, sexism, dealing with, you know, 
gender identity, dealing with sexuality, dealing with all these things, but in a way that's just like, it's a normal thing. Everyone's going to experience things much differently. And I think that's the great thing about it is that we're all just human beings. Unless you're listening in this in space, then hello from space. <laughs> hello, aliens. Hello, yeah. Our voices have been projected out and have become a very weird selection of humanity for you to hear. Uh, so thank you for that, our alien non-overlords yet. If you do become our alien overlords, hello, or welcome. Or maybe if you're a demigod listening. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, there's an episode of Star Trek a where uh, there's an alien that thinks he's the god Apollo. Really? Yeah. It's the second season, season two, episode two. I was going to say you're a nerd, but I think we already knew that, so I think we'll just move on. I mean, that's one of the wonderful things, and I think that's one of the most important things. We have an email from Evan. Please continue your podcast. It's very enjoyable, and I really like when you read my emails, and I would like to ask, do you think Annabeth <coughs> or Grover is Percy's favorite favorite? Uh, favorite favorite? Uh, you mean best friends? I don't know. I think... Percy Jackson yeah. doesn't have favorites. I think both of his friends are frenzies. They're if this was MySpace, they would both be fighting for that number one spot. For the top eight. Spot. <laughs> for the top yeah. eight. Oh yeah. man, I just had like a very <laughs> severe flashback to MySpace when you said that. Yeah, if you mean like favorite like friend, then I have no idea. Probably, I mean he likes both of them so much because they're friends. They care about each other, but also. If you mean, like, romantic interest, I feel like the book could be setting up Annabeth as a romantic interest, but that could just all be just me expecting that. I don't know. I mean, we're not going to get into ships on this podcast whatsoever, so that's kind of the thing. Yeah. It's like, if it happens, just, we're going to just, opinion. there's a relationship in these books, we're going to be like, yeah, okay, that's cool. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much our go-to when it comes to ships. Okay, if it happens, it happens. Eh. Isn't that how the world works? Some people fall in love with each other and some people fall out of love. So we yeah. got another email, which at first confused me, but then I realized that it kind of shot me in my foot <laughs> right. and I'm so happy. You told me about this. <laughs> so we got one from Chris and it just says Avatar and it starts naming off uh, the three Avatar characters of James Cameron's Avatar. And I was like, I'm not sure if this if this defeats the purpose that I couldn't understand the question until I had to Google these people to understand the <laughs> answer. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember this. said now. Avatar as the subject line. Um, yeah, I'm sure there are people out there who remember characters from Avatar. Many people do not. <laughs> no, I think it the, was a we're, somewhat we're, forgettable movie. <laughs> the joke that I was trying to get across, though, was it's like Avatar by James Cameron is one of the high actually is the highest grossing movie of all time and no one remembers that a select few group of people do remember like things about it because you know it most likely is their favorite movie or they've seen it so many times but most people have only yeah, seen it statistically, once statistically there's someone out there who loves that movie but it's space pocahontas <laughs> so we got a message from sean hi i'm sean and i'm a young fan but i am caught up and it's nice to talk to someone about the books also the puns are killing me <laughs> LOL. Do we make that many puns? I don't even notice. Um, I don't know. I think they should just put me in the penitentiary, but that's just me. <sighs> this is like punishment. Uh, hi, Zach and B. It's me again. My name is Babe, and I'm from Thailand, and I decided to send you another Iris message again. Hope it's not too much for you guys to read another one. Ha ha. No, no, it's not. We love getting emails yeah. from everybody. Never stop sending like us emails. I hearing from you again. It is true, as you guys said in the episode, that listening to podcasts feels like you're listening to your friends talking. I feel like I made two new friends from across the world who love the same Aww. things that I love. It is a weird feeling, isn't it? This, That's really sweet. This podcast becomes part of my weekly routine, and I l am looking forward to it every Monday. Listening to you guys doesn't make Mondays uh, feel boring. They make Mondays feel a lot more fun. <laughs> There are a lot of books to read, and I am excited for what's to come next. Keep up the great work. P.S. Thank you for reading this email and other ones I've sent before via email and Twitter. I hope it doesn't bother you guys so much, lol. No, we don't Don't bother us when it comes to that. It doesn't bother us at all. I feel like there's like a trend of people apologizing for when they message us. I really appreciate when we get messages, no matter how small or extensive the email is or whatever. I, we always appreciate feedback from you know, whatever. Send us the list of Avatar characters. 
<laughs> yeah, because it's funny and it makes us really think about like, oh yeah, I forgot we made a joke like that. Oh yeah. That's the weird thing about having a podcast is you just have a conversation with your friend and then there's like a like record of what you said and then people talk about it months later because they just found your podcast and you don't remember saying anything like that and then you have it's to go back it's like, it took me like a like a couple minutes to like figure out because I, I knew it was avatar but I'm like when did i make an avatar joke <laughs> when did we make an avatar joke and like oh yeah i forgot it's space pocahontas with dancing with the wolves dances with weird braided dances with the smurfs things. yeah that's basically what it is <laughs> no offense if you like that movie but it's true. I don't think it's the best James Cameron movie. Go watch True Lies. Uh, we didn't get really any reviews this week. Not that I am aware of. Yeah, I haven't checked them recently. No. Sometimes if if we don't answer any reviews, sometimes it's because you're in a different country and iTunes has this weird thing where I have to like manually like look through all of them. So sometimes yeah, I'm it's like, really quite annoying. It's, it's annoying. <laughs> they don't aggregate all of them. So if you're like in another country somewhere... And you want us to read your review? Just tweet at then, us. Like maybe email, yeah, email us or tweet at us. Um, either of us or the show's Twitter. There's a lot of ways to contact us. Also, sometimes it takes a couple of days for them to appear on iTunes, so sometimes we might miss yeah. them. So yeah, if we don't read your review right away, you might wait a week and then the next episode. Also, we we record the the episodes somewhat in advance, so if you leave a review in between recording and when we release then we obviously will not see it so there's a lot of reasons why we we may not see your review thank you everyone for listening to another wonderful episode of radio camp half blood i want to thank our patreon sponsors because they're amazing we're going to be getting that whole episode out very very soon once everything crazy stops going down because just work and everything i haven't had a chance to like edit all of them all the way through they're about halfway down for both of them but they're coming very very soon those episodes are going to be coming very soon so if you want to follow us and support us on Patreon, we'd really appreciate it. You can follow us on Patreon slash Radio Camp Half Blood. Where can they find you, B? Uh, you can find me on Tumblr at uh, twinpoetry.tumblr.com. And you can find me on Twitter at B. Kelly Gorman. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can follow me at Suda41. That's S-U-D-A-4-1. If you want to email our show, you can email us at radio camp half blood at gmail.com if you want to to send us any random email we'd love it we appreciate it you can send us you know little things you want us to talk about or you know even like a funny punny joke that'd be real fun to do too on the show well i'm zach i'm b and keep staying mortal bye see you guys <laughs>